at one point, way before it was worth 11 grand, and they stopped the transaction, it stayed pending, it wasn't on the blockchain, it wasn't anywhere. So I call them up in the morning, so it was 10 p.m. at night, so obviously they weren't there. And they say, oh, that's a lot of Bitcoin. We want to make sure it's really you, because we don't want you to lose your six Bitcoin. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. So it's actually, they did you know, complete phone verification, and then they released my transaction, which was good. But it makes, it's really simple. And that's a payment processor. That's the niche they've taken. Want to pay anybody in Thailand in the bank account? You just, if you have some Bitcoin sitting at coins, and I know your bank account, I just type, oh, I want to send Pat 10,000 baht. So I put in 10,000 baht, it says it's this much Bitcoin, 15 baht fee, no matter how much money you're sending. And then put in his K-Bank details, click send, verify that, yep. And then within less than an hour, the money's in his account. And it's, they also pay your phone bill, your electric bill, a whole number of bills. They make it easy. There's another one. Skip through. Oh, this one. BXIN.IN.TH. This is actually an exchange. Good news is they let you do all kinds of things. The bad news is they don't take Americans. No American citizens, no American permanent residents, no people accessing from America. So it doesn't do me personally any good, but no, my wife can sign up for an account. Because then, again, it makes it easy to get other cryptocurrencies if you want them. And they also have the ability to withdraw Thai bot and things like that. So they're, they're pretty good and pretty easy. Easy to buy, easy to cash out, covers major cryptos. But like I said, this one, for me personally, is kind of bad. Now, Obviously, I have a Thai wife, so I can get around that one, but it has to be her account, her selfie, her verification, because get verified for any of these things. You want to trade Bitcoin, want to trade crypto on any exchange, you're going to hold up a selfie with your passport next to your face and hope it can read it. My friend has a Canadian passport. His computer, after seven tries, he could not get them to accept the picture. It didn't pass. We had to use my computer to get his selfie to work so he could get his account verified. Coins.ph is the same company as Coins.co.th. So if anybody has friends in the Philippines, that it's really easy. Some are actually their app on your phone is a, is a pesos app, not Taibot. It just happens to be the way they do it. Because obviously, as most people know, the biggest export the Philippines has are people, overseas workers. And they spend a fortune remitting money back home using things like Western Union and MoneyGram. So when you can send it back using Bitcoin or crypto with much lower fees, usually, I say usually for the simple reason that these guys let you, coins.co.th, you can pick your transaction fee from low to medium to high. Low means it's the cheapest fee, but also no guarantee when it'll be transmitted. Because if the network gets overloaded, the miners take the ones that are paying the highest transaction fees. So it can take time for transactions to get verified in the Bitcoin world. So don't get upset when you send somebody Bitcoin and after 10 minutes they go, where's my Bitcoin? Where's my Bitcoin? So chill out, relax. You know, the, it's a network thing. There's no guarantee you're going to be in the next block. Bitcoin is not good for instantaneous payment. So it could take hours. But I had a transaction, someone said they had to get it there, so I paid the highest fee, and the highest fee cost me 26 bucks. Not real convenient paying 26 bucks transaction fee if you're buying a Starbucks for five bucks. But that's why there's other cryptocurrencies out there. That's coins.ph. Again, Club has a copy of my presentation. Okay, almost done. I think this is my last slide. But this just give you an idea of the craziness in just the Bitcoin market. Because people will say, oh, Bitcoins is too expensive, but you don't have to buy a whole Bitcoin. One of the things we do is with our partner, they have mathematical models that model all this. So what it did was show on November 9th, on November 9th at 10 p.m., this is East Coast time, Bitcoin was at 7,220 bucks. Right here. See that little red dot? That red dot means go to cash. The model is saying you should go to cash. We're detecting it's going to, we expect it's going to go down. The whole idea of these models is to protect what you have first. 
Grow it and protect it. Get you into cash before a huge drop. So, that's what happened. And just to know that I didn't make the price up on Bittrex at the 9th of November at 10 p.m. Eastern Time, the price was 72.20. That's just where the 72.20 comes from. Next, you just kind of hang out for a few days and look at the signal, and nothing changed for those next few days until it turned green right here at this point right here. It went green. So on November 12th, three days later, it went green when Bitcoin had dropped to 59.76. So we go here, and you can see it's 59.76. We didn't make up the money amount. Then Bitcoin as of when this chart was done, the 23rd at 3 p.m. was 81.71. Now. Because this is an investment advice, I won't do the exact math. The exact math is not on here, but just think about it for a minute. If I had one Bitcoin and I sold it for $7,220, and then I bought back $7,220 worth of Bitcoin when it was at $59.76, you would agree I have some more Bitcoin than I started with, right? Then the price went to $81.71. So my more Bitcoin I have that I started with is now also worth more money. You'd agree with that, right? Now, you can do the math yourself. You go do these calculations. Um, amongst friends, if, if it was personal, I could share what the amounts are and all those kind of things, but this is an investment advice. I'm not an investment advisor. So just look at it yourself and you can see, yes, you would, if you followed it, you would have had more Bitcoin. The whole idea of this whole thing is to help you wind up with more Bitcoin. Because percentages in U.S. dollars don't mean anything. Because if I had a Bitcoin on that day, on November 9th, and I did nothing, my Bitcoin is worth more money. So that's a fact. The idea, though, is by getting out before it dips too much and getting you back in when it's lower, you have the ability to wind up with more Bitcoin. So that, that's a product that we have. So this is again to help people, that just shows the price of 8171. Now it's at 11 grand. Okay, any questions? After, if you want to know more, there's my contact details. Red has my contact details. I will answer questions. We've got one over here first. Just wait for the Wait for a microphone. I have one on your left here, please. Oh, we got one closer over here. Yes, hi there. It's uh, Tor. Um, I was wondering, on the 18th this month, they're starting to trade the Bitcoin futures on the stock market, the CME group. Are they going to buy every Bitcoin they sell on the market? Are they going to buy a Bitcoin? Good question. I don't know the answer to that. I can look it up. I just haven't thought. Yeah, the, the CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, I believe it is, or CBO, I can't remember, but from December 18th in the United States you'll be able to trade Bitcoin futures. So what a lot of people are saying, that's going to cut the volatility a little bit, but also they believe it will help raise prices because now institutional money will have an easier way to get it. But I don't know the answer to that question. If they buy up, if, uh, the CME, CME group is called, yeah. if they have more than 51% of all Bitcoins, is that a threat to Bitcoin? No. No, the 51% I was referring to, it's called a 51% attack. That means you control 51% of all the mining capability that exists, which means you have the ability to muck around with the transactions and do something called replay, which means that you can double spend, you know, spend the same Bitcoin twice, which would kind of be a really bad thing. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was born in Stanford, Connecticut, so... Uh, Don't walk here. Pretty, pretty close. Uh, Bitcoin started in 09. Could you speak up a bit, please? Yeah, Bitcoin uh, started in 09, uh, which was the beginning of a business cycle. And we are now at or near the end of a business cycle. Now, explain to me as best you can what the reaction of Bitcoin is going to be 
in a business cycle which is on the downtrend. Well, what do I think is going to happen when markets, like when the stock market goes down? A business cycle. In general, yeah. The stock market plus reset. Just the whole I know of them. You can't be in growth forever. Um, I think Bitcoin will have its ups and downs, but I think personally it will go up. People will move out of, this is my opinion, and this is what a lot of other people who make way more money than I do uh, are saying that they feel Bitcoin, you know, they're predicting $100,000 Bitcoin next year, a million dollars potentially in the next five years. That's what they're all saying. Uh, have you thought about the probability, possibility of a electromagnetic pulse and what it's, uh, what problems Bitcoin's going to have with that? Yeah, if there was an EMP and it wiped out a whole bunch of computers, that... Now, here's the good thing about Bitcoin blockchain. You have to wipe out every single computer that exists that has that blockchain to kill Bitcoin. As long as there's a copy, you have... Because every single mining computer has a complete copy of every record back to 2009. So you'd have to wipe out all the computers. Now, if there was a big EMP, it sure as heck would screw up Bitcoin, but uh, I think if there was an EMP, we'd have a lot more things screwed up besides Bitcoin as well. So that would not be the only thing. But yeah, it would be a big mess for Bitcoin, for sure. It'd be a big mess for anything driven by computers. Or... Uh, yeah, hi. Good morning. Um, yeah, I started in Bitcoin a couple of months ago. I put two hundred dollars in eToro.com. You probably have it. Yes, yeah, so double my money. They don't take Americans either. <laughs> double my money in, in, in five weeks. And, uh, from then, though, what what you haven't talked about, and I, I've got some in the Swedish uh, stock market. Uh, you can put it in euros or kronas, and also I have some in dollars. Uh, I don't seem to find anywhere I can put it to pounds. I do it through my stock broker in London into euros. Uh, that, I have a couple of other questions. <laughs> How come, when all the computers, it uses so much power that apparently, uh, you know, some of these small countries, it, it's, uh, the power is as much as some of these small countries. So what happens when it gets bigger? That's the other question. <laughs> and the third one, I'll try and keep it, um, was uh, if people are talking about it going up 10 times or whatever, I mean, to my mind, most of the money's already gone in it because you've got uh, Julian Assange has gone up 50,000 bucks because he couldn't put his money into banks, so he put it into Bitcoin. Uh, you've got all these uh, very, very rich people put in, so I think it's going to slow down a bit. But I think it has a future, and I think we can pay, we will be able to pay for things in Bitcoin. I know there's already hundreds of thousands of customers or, or shops that will take it. Yeah. Okay, let me answer your third question first. The reality is all the big returns have been made in Bitcoins. It went from pennies to $11,000. 11,000 bucks to 100 is only 900,000, is only nine times. So the big returns have all been made in Bitcoin. I mean, the guy, I'm talking, you know, 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times your money. So that's, that's the answer to that question, you know, 100% correct on that one. There's still money to be made in Bitcoin and people should have it. It's becoming more like a more normal asset class that everybody's used to. With still significantly more returns than most things, but not at the crazy money. Now the power question, yeah, I've read that. <laughs> that's why a lot of the newer coins out there other than Bitcoin uh, use different algorithms that don't require as much computer capacity and how their, how their coins are created is different. You have a Bitcoin mining, like I said, you know, one Bitcoin at the moment is about a thousand bucks worth of electric power. So yeah, that is, that is an issue. That's why places where mining is popular is where power is cheap. But I didn't quite understand your first question, but on Forex, uh, I'm not sure we actually have Forex signals, much like the ones on Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Ethereum, but we don't touch anybody's money. You, do that, and I'm not exactly sure where, where you can get easy access to forums. Who was the next question? Right here. Fantastic talk. Really enjoyed it. Okay. Bitcoin is now around eleven thousand dollars, and let's say it's going to go to seventy thousand dollars. So, isn't it much better to buy a currency or a coin for a dollar, expecting it to go to seven dollars? We get the same returns. 
So the question that everybody's asking on the internet, YouTube, whatever, is which is this small, smaller coin which you want to get involved with, which you could buy now for a dollar, ten dollars, twenty dollars, and it will go up to five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars within one year, five years. So if Bitcoin will go, the others will also go. If Bitcoin will suffer because of government regulations, the others will also do it. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Let's see. Let's, how's my crystal ball working? That's what the question. No, the reality is it's a heck of a lot easier to take a cryptocurrency from 10 cents, 50 cents to five bucks or 10 bucks. I mean, if you actually knew how, how to do it, it's not that difficult. It takes money. <clears throat> but then you gotta be able to, people got to be able to cash out and things like that. It looks a lot like penny stocks. Anybody's ever familiar with the penny stock market? <clears throat> you know, the, all of these non-Bitcoin coins, all the cheapy ones, you know, behave very similarly. So you got to worry about liquidity, <clears throat> you know, how much you have, how much you hold relative to the total. Because, like, <clears throat> you can do initial coin offerings and fund these new things, and you can wind up with 100 million coins that you paid a tenth of a cent for. So you didn't spend a huge amount of money in total, but you got all these coins. But, and then it gets to 20 cents. But if you try and sell a lot, any significant selling, because there's not huge volumes every day, you blow the price up. So yeah, it looks like on paper, you're a gazillionaire. You have 100 million of them and you got it to 50 cents, so you have $50 million in theory. <clears throat> but you try to start cashing anything out, you crash the price. So that's what people have to worry about. But your statement that is true, um, it's going to be a lot easier <clears throat> when some of these secondary ones, you know, some of the ones below the top 10 that sell for way less than thousands of dollars to go up in value substantially, <clears throat> just because it's a lot easier to go from 20 cents to a buck. Just, it's a psychology thing. Of course, what most people don't realize in Bitcoin, they say, oh God, how am I going to get any Bitcoin when it's 100 grand? Bitcoin goes to decimal places. It looks funky, I know, having point zero 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 one Bitcoin. But at 100 grand, that's a penny. So Bitcoin has to get to a lot of money before, you know, you can't use it for relatively small transactions. It doesn't go to eight decimal places. But the answer, you know, some of the good ones, <clears throat> look for the use case. Why does that coin exist? Like, for instance, you know, I'll have that mixed emotion. You ask which one that's not priced super high and has a chance to go up. Ripple, XRP, that's the one that all the big banks use for bank to bank settlement. It's kind of funny, the banks, you know, crypto is something that could, everybody says, is going to kill the banks. Yet, the top banks are all part of a consortium that uses Ripple, XRP. I think it's in the 20 something cent range. So that, that's probably one that has a good chance. Uh, there's one locally, Amisco, that's actually out of Thailand, that's relatively, they made it to the top 10 market cap, but again, it's a banking style payment app. So again, it has a use case. So that one's pretty good. Um, we, as part of our company, analyze all the new ones that are coming out. We do about 10 to 12 of them a week and recommend which ones look like they have real use cases and where we're gonna put some of our own money. So we can talk about that too. But there's two of them that look pretty good. I mean, some people, I mean, look at the top 10 ones and look at the pricing relative to Bitcoin and look at the trading. <clears throat> you know, so I'm not gonna recommend which one, but those are two for sure that are heavily used and have a legitimate use case that will grow. Independent, you know, independent of what the economy's doing, <clears throat> banks still have to transact. And use of the blockchain, and this is the last comment I wanna make, which is kind of an important thing for everybody to remember. Bitcoin, yeah, it's cool, it's up to 11,000 bucks and it's got 160, 178 billion market cap. <clears throat> that's wonderful. But it's the, the underlying technology called the blockchain. That's where all the huge value is to the world. It doesn't have to be a, a currency to do anything. Next question. I just want to say another one thing. One last question, please. Just one, one more thing, one more thing. 0.3% okay. of all the electricity in the world is used by Bitcoin mining. 0.3%. 0 0.3. Yeah, 0.3%. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's significant. Okay, right here. Yeah, I've actually got two questions. Say I have a PC and I've got a hardware wallet on my PC. No EMP 
just tie electric gets this big surge and kills my PC, <laughs> kills my hard drive, what do I do? Hopefully when you set your wallet up, you did two very, very critical things. One, write down your 12 word seed phrase. You have these 12 random words, write those down. <clears throat> two, write down your private key. If you have those two things on a piece of paper somewhere safe, who cares about your hard drive? Okay, the other question I have is, say I am traveling to India, and somebody robs me of everything. Yep. I can call up my visa. I can call up my visa people and say, "Send me a new card." Talk to them for a little while, and they'll send me the card without too much trouble. Yep. What do I do if all my money is out? It's from my mobile phone, and um, it's Bitcoin. <clears throat> if you have Bitcoin and you know where you're keeping your Bitcoin, again, if you have that 12-word key phrase, or you remember your private key. Those two things should never be stolen. Your friend have it. Your met your friend. <clears throat> it, those two things should never be stolen from you because they should never both be together at the same time. Actually, either one of those is good enough to access your Bitcoin from anywhere. <clears throat> so, so memorize your private key. Put it somewhere safe <clears throat> where you can find it, even if you had everything stolen. Or memorize that twelve-word seed phrase. <clears throat> so then, one other point, you bring up a good point though. Now you hear about these Bitcoin gold and Bitcoin this, Bitcoin that. And they say, oh yeah, we need your 12 word seed phrase to give you your free coins. First rule, move everything out of whatever wallet is tied to the, that seed phrase and private key and put it in a brand new one. Then you're going to give up that key and get your free coins. Because if you give up that key or you give up those 12 words, they have control of your Bitcoin account. I think we had one last question. Um, I know quite a few people, in, or we've had conversations with people in town that have actually been trading Bitcoin into various coins and so on and so forth, and all of them have lost their money, not from a bad trade, but mainly because they can't get their money out of the foreign exchange, either because there's a verification of their identity or the company goes away or whatever. How can you possibly know which companies are safe to deal with so you don't lose your money? That seems to be the theme that odds are really high you will. Yeah, that's a good point. I know some people have had difficulties like with Bittrex and verification and then sitting to get verified and I want to get my money out. They accepted my money. They accepted my KYC document to get in, but getting out is a lot harder. Uh, Google is your friend. I mean, <clears throat> Google it and check and see. There's forums, bitcointalk.org. Talks about all this stuff. Reddit, Medium. All those three will help you. You can figure out there's threads all over the place <clears throat> where you can say, oh my God, I'm dealing with XYZ exchange. I can't get my money out. So, I mean, that's how you find it. And I have a friend also who had a lot of money in politics, which is a US exchange. And their support team was 6,000 tickets behind. So he had $600,000 tied up for six weeks. He could trade, but he couldn't get anything out anyway. But yeah, you have to look for that. Okay, I'll be around for a bit for more questions. I think I'm over time already. Please give Dan a big hand. And uh, thank you for uh, such an informative talk on Bitcoins, the next cryptocurrency. I've got a certificate of appreciation for you here, Dan, if you'd just like to step down here. Please go. Please go. Go. I broke my hip for a few years ago. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And uh, will you still be around to ask any answer any questions after the meeting? Yes. So if you've got any questions, not too long, so everybody can get a go. Uh, see there after the interview.